I had known Ray Nasher all my professional life from ULI and uh, various development groups. And uh, I would have considered him a kind of distant friend. Um, someone you'd know when you saw him at a meeting, but not necessarily you'd, someone you'd call up for dinner. Um, and that had been pretty much our relationship up until uh, he had uh, Renzo call me and ask if we had worked if we would work on the uh, on the garden, um, he had called me a number of times before uh, when he was trying to figure out where to put the sculpture collection. And I think it's important to remember that this is a collection of over 600 uh, objects, and that the garden isn't a permanent museum; it's a gallery that these objects move through. So. Those were the conversations we had originally. Um, when Renzo called, I said, you know, I'd be delighted. Uh, Ray didn't really describe um, some larger vision for the collection. He had a house, a suburban house, on about five acres, and the collection uh, sort of cycle through that garden. He would change things, move things into a warehouse, move them back. He also had a large shopping center and he would move pieces through that. So basically what he wanted was a, was a gallery that he could move his pieces, but also future other pieces uh, in and out of the garden, which meant that there were some difficult um, requirements, like being able to get trucks in and out, being able to get a crane over the wall, a lot of technical requirements that you wouldn't have in a normal sculpture outdoor museum. Um, but aside from that, I don't think there was any particular vision he had. He pretty much allowed uh, Renzo and I to go ahead and, and design this thing. And um, of course, he was part of all of those discussions. Um, they had already chosen this parking lot downtown next to the museum, and the building had not been sited and therefore not designed. Renzo had a whole series of studies, which we talked about and finally came to the conclusion that the museum should be on Flora uh, to be part of the arts district rather than someplace else on the, on the property. Um, Renzo's notion of the building was a series of walls, which even when you were on Flora, you could look through the gallery all the way out to the garden, that it would be transparent, very transparent in the north-south direction and completely opaque in the east-west uh, uh, connection. So these great walls, and he described these walls as being archeological in nature, as if you found them there. Big, in a sense, rough walls. They're quite a bit more refined than I think originally was intended. We tried to make the garden, because of this extraordinary opportunity of looking through, we tried to make the garden essentially north and south as well, and a series of hedges plus rows of, of uh, trees, a series of alleys of trees, together made up this gallery. And the only difference between an inside gallery and an outside gallery, um, there are some tricky things outside about lighting. Uh, there, is, there are security problems. But the main problem about inside and outside is that they have uh, the, no ability to put up additional walls. In an, in an interior gallery, you have the primary space, and then you have a secondary space that is essentially uh, formed under the under the guidance of the curators, uh, and then those, those secondary walls, sheetrock walls generally, um, are taken out and then the next show re reconfigures it. In the outside, you can't move things in and out quite so, quite so easily. The other problem is that Ray's collection, which is all museum quality, was of tremendous range of sizes. And so we had pieces that were almost intimate in scale, um, most of those went inside or on a terrace. Um, pieces of human scale, which is like all art, um, and then pieces that were semi-monumental and then pieces that were truly monumental. The larger pieces posed a problem of claustrophobia. 
that they wouldn't feel that they had enough room in the garden, and therefore the, the, the number of pieces at any given time in the garden is probably 25 and down, so that the place does not look crowded. We do, we've done lots of sculpture gardens, uh, large ones outdoors, uh, more limited ones, personal collections, public collections, um, collections where each piece is individually set, collections where pieces are sometimes there and sometimes not. And I've been very interested in, in sculpture gardens and of course the, the great sculpture garden at PepsiCo. I take my students there for 15 years every year. So I, you know, I was pretty much familiar and I was familiar with a lot of the ones in Europe as well. Clearly working with Renzo is an important point. He's a great architect. It was an important part in our career, although we'd work with lots of fine architects. It wasn't as if it was the first big name architect. But Renzo has a particular way of looking at things and of approaching things, and I learned a good deal from him. Uh, it was important. Um, the sculpture garden has been very well received. And of course, you never know when you're doing a project whether that's going to be the case. Um, obviously, if you do a major project in New York, like the High Line or the Memorial, um, they receive a lot of media attention. There isn't much media in Dallas or even in San Francisco. So clearly, projects receive attention. A lot of, a lot of that attention has to do with where they are and what they're trying to do. Dallas, on the other hand, even though there are very fine gardens in Dallas, not very many of them have, a, have uh, achieved national attention. Um, and for some reason, this one did, partly, I think, because of the quality of the art, partly because of the uh, uh, char character and uh, interest in the people that were involved in it. Um, but clearly, that attention helps any landscape architect, assuming it's good attention, helps any landscape architect, and this did too. Our design intent was, was the same design intent we have on most of our projects, which is a sort of minimal thing. I try to pare things down so that they do the work and provide the spaces that people need. But beyond that, I try to limit uh, superfluous things. And this was no different. I think this is particularly true in art. It doesn't necessarily have to be rectilinear, but this is particularly true of art because, I mean, as I've said a number of times, I think what you're doing with, with sculpture gardens and outdoor gardens is that you're providing like an opera or a theater, and then the sculpture are the players. So in this case, there were a variety of sculptures, and so they had to accommodate a variety of players, and these would change, which again is something unique about this this particular uh, place. As I mentioned, the architecture and the landscape architecture are essentially using the same basic geometries. And um, we provided some places where there was canopies so that you had different size rooms, if you want to think of them that way. And we also were very careful to find that there would be small places and large places. It's not exactly true that, that the size of a sculpture essentially defines the space that it's in, or vice versa. There are some small pieces that have a tremendous presence, and they actually need more space. On the other hand, you get a DeSouvero or a, a, a Sarah, uh, they can, you can put them out in a parking lot and they, and they count. So you don't have to worry about those. It's like having you know, an opera singer who has a great big voice. You don't have to worry about people hearing it. But you do have to worry about someone who has a fine, delicate voice. And so theaters, operas, so forth, have to deal with this range of, of performers. And, and I think of the art pretty much that way. The building is interesting in that it's essentially doing two things at once. It's doing this thing I mentioned, this north-south sort of looking through. But it's also picking up north light through a really, really delicate um, grill that's on top of the arches. And those grills are rather sophisticated. They only pick up north light. And that gives a kind of even light to the gallery. Sometimes people do it with scrims, break up the light with scrims. But in this instance, Renzo was trying for something where the inside spaces are much like the outside spaces, where he was sort of picking up certain kinds of light and letting other kinds of light that would be destructive go by. And so that uh, is one of the keys to, to the architecture. 
The tower project, uh, of course, attacks that grill. It redirects light, hot light, not northern light, hot light down through the grill and throws uh, patterns on walls, paintings, sculptures, where Renzo was trying to achieve a kind of uniform lighting, uh, an even lighting, not so much uniform, but even. And of course, it disrupts that. Um, of course, you, you know, we have a, uh, uh, a one piece of sculpture where you look up to the sky, and uh, the building destroyed that right off the bat. It came into the picture plane. So the Tyrell was, was destroyed the minute the building was built and will have to be completely redesigned. For the landscape, the building poses two problems. One is it being very close and changing the scale of the gallery that you're walking through. Now I have no problem of having buildings, large buildings around, downtown Dallas is full of large buildings and uh, I think there's a, actually a kind of quality um, at the Museum of Modern Art, Yoshi Taniguchi actually exploited that quality with windows in the various galleries to look out on this sort of canyon of, of buildings. So I didn't really mind that. But it was the um, aggressiveness visually of the building which was our first concern. And that was our concern long before we knew about this light business, this reflection business. The reflection is pure and simply, I, you know, there are um, various experts weighing in on this, uh, expert witnesses. But in fact, what the, what the uh, uh, reflection does is it's very much like putting light uh, through a magnifying glass. It essentially burns everything that it sees. And it, because it sweeps, the sun sweeps across it, um, it burns a kind of ray. It's even burning out into the, into the park beyond, the one over the freeway. So it's that burning which is, which is a problem. Now, some of our plant materials are sturdy enough um, to resist sort of dying when the first gets burned. The oaks, on the other hand, start producing much smaller leaves. And it's their way, if you look at oaks in a hot climate, if you, the same oak will have a smaller leaf to have less radiation on the leaves. And in the long run, it will affect its life. But in the short run, it will make the, the tree grow unevenly. And, um, and that, that contraction of leaf size is a real problem. The deciduous trees, uh, the cedar elms on the other hand, defoliate and are burned and then you really don't know how they react in the next season and the next season and the next season. Some trees, um, you know, respond to that and like willows and so forth, they can take a lot of beating and come back. Um, but some trees are, their form is affected um, and, and we're not quite sure whether the cedar elms are going to do that or not. At the very least, our horticultural says that the regularity the one side versus the other side being evened uh, will be affected. It's burning all the cherries, all the hedges, and of course the hedges, even though they're slightly loosely clipped, are still geometric. They are part of the scheme. They are part of that wall system which goes north and south. And of course, wherever they come in tack with that, they burn it. And even the lawn, which you would think would be more resilient, even the lawn is showing uh, a different kind of wear. We have a lot, the, the garden is tremendously popular and people come, they have weddings there, bar mitzvahs, all sorts of things. Um, and there is damage and we, you know, we have tried to uh, develop grasses in there. We've changed some of the mixes in order to be tougher for this use. But even in addition to that, uh, the grass seems to be much more susceptible to having a, a beam of light right on it and that area that's being affected is clearly not growing in the same manner as the, as the rest of the lawns. If something isn't done, it will have its effect. And even though the landscape grows slowly and each year, you know, you see an effect each year, some you see an effect every year, like the lawns and the hedges, the trees are probably going to play out this scenario over a long period of time. Um, 
And someone can say, well, you know, the change is very slight. But in 10 years, you will see that. We have put in, you know, wonderful new soil, beautiful irrigation. I mean, everything we could do technically to make this place grow and thrive uh, is being attacked in part just where the light is hitting. Um, and there's no question in my mind that it will be reduced in value, drastically reduced in value. Um, it's not the immediate effect that you see with the Terrell and with, the, and with Renzo's grill, but it is there, it is visible, and it will get worse. It's not gonna get better. Let's see, we, we do a lot of sculpture gardens. They're all different. They all have different patrons. They all have different curatorial strategies. Some of them uh, involve automobiles being inside. Some of them are entirely pedestrian. We have one we're working on now that's 200 acres, somewhat the scale of PepsiCo. Um, so each one is different. Uh, over the years, I'm a collector. Over the years, I've learned a great deal about art. And one of the things I've learned about art is that I don't know that much about it. And so every, everyone is a new learning curve. You have to talk to the sculptors. You have to talk to the curators. You have to learn again each time. You will learn something new, and you will respond to something new. The fact that we've done a number of them means that I know that and means that I go through that exercise carefully. Um, I've talked to, I don't know, dozens and dozens of experts of various kinds that have to do with museums. I've, know many of the sculptors personally. Um, I've placed many big pieces. I've placed a number of smaller pieces, trying to f give them more presence. So I think we're, we're at least sensitive to that, simply because we've experienced it a lot. Um, and my guess is that we will go on doing that kind of work because we're noted for that, amongst other things. By the time that the garden was, was completed. The garden is never quite completed, but by the time it was open, ready for uh, people to go in, Ray and Renzo and I had developed a really close working relationship, and that's not one without heat. There were many times a particular point would be argued and argued again and argued again, and I think that's, that's the right way to go about it. Um, I think Ray put it best. Uh, he said, you know, Renzo has an ego. Um, Pete has a e big ego. Um, and I have a big ego. And that was sort of what he expected. He expected a, a rousing debate about as many pieces of it as possible. Um, Ray, when he died, was a dear friend. I worked with him after that on a number of other things. Um, we were at the Louvre uh, doing a presentation on the sculpture garden and there were other people presenting other sculpture gardens. And uh, we'd gone to the ambassador's house and Ray loved to talk about art and he loved to promote it. He was a, and he loved his own collection. He loved promoting his own collection. And he was in good, good voice that night. I mean, he, he gave a funny and uh, uh, passionate speech. And then the next day he got on a plane and he was essentially mortally ill um, by the time that plane landed in Dallas. And I heard the following day that he had died on the way to the hospital. So it's a sad, uh, a sad end. Um, the people who run the uh, uh, gallery are all friends of mine. The people on the board, some of them raise daughters, uh, are friends. And it's one of the projects which every t whenever I go to Dallas, I go over there and look around, write a note or get the, get the director and say, you know, what about this, what about this? If he's got any problem, he calls me. I probably get a half a dozen calls a, a year. I probably go to Dallas half a dozen, maybe more times a year. So our relationship to the project continues. And of course, this this attack on the garden and on the building and on the art uh, has brought us even closer together. And, and I assume that for the length of this uh, difficulty that we're having, uh, we will stay close to it and uh, 
Um, I'm obviously very, very interested um, in the outcome. Uh, it's, it seems to me unthinkable that another designer, and I know Scott, um, would not see the issue, would not see the problem, would not respond to it. If, if it were my, something we were doing, which was causing trouble to some other designer or other project of a major nature, uh, nature I can't imagine not responding and doing everything I could to make sure uh, that, that our work wasn't impinging on someone else's work. The fact that we came earlier, or the fact that one of our projects perhaps came earlier, was not the important fact. The important fact is that you try to protect, you try to protect your own designs, you try to protect others' designs. Gardens are fragile. Many, many things can happen to them during, <laughs> during the design and construction, but also afterwards. And um, one, if, if you value gardens at all, and if you value fine gardens particularly, it seems to me you can expect someone, another designer, not to just say, well, there's nothing there, nothing happens, there's no problem. Uh, that's beyond my uh, comprehension.